Okay, recording. Hi everyone, I'm Anna. This is the business of being. Welcome to the first ever episode. I'm so, so excited to welcome our first guest. He's the vice president of strategy at iFood, one of the largest, fastest growing, I would say, delivery services, delivery platforms in all of Brazil. It's blown Uber Eats out of the water all the way from Sao Paulo. I want to welcome on the podcast, Diego. Diego Barret, welcome. Hi, Ana, how are you? Great to be here with you. Congratulations for, for this step. I really appreciate to be invited. Well, it's my pleasure to have you on. Um, I've been wanting to have, you know, these, these conversations with leaders such as yourself for a long time now, and I think you were just the perfect guest. And let me, let me tell the audience a little bit about how we came to, to meet per se. So I met you last year in, was it December? in Sao Paulo, where I saw you speak about iFood being the deal of the year. Um, you had just been backed by a VC fund. And I have to say, well, one of the first things that really, really um, got my attention was you walking into an event, a corporate event, private equity in a t-shirt and sneakers. That was, that was the first thing I would have to say. Um, and the second thing was basically the way that you were able to speak about leadership, entrepreneurship, and tie it up with the importance of ethics, personal growth, and how relevant, you just made it really relevant to the days we live in. It was really refreshing just to hear you communicate on stage. You're obviously a very good communicator. And that's what initially got my attention. And, and that's where I really thought, no, I need to have an in-depth conversation with this guy because he is the real deal. <laughs> that's, that's really good to listen to this, Anna. And, and this is for me an impression that is, that is part of the, 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 the modern days. Uh, and, and what I mean about this is, uh, we 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 was we were born in a society where the way you dress, the color of your skin, your surname, among other things, were as important as your capacity to think, capacity to communicate, uh, how intellectual you are, and etc. And uh, and more and more with the transparency that the internet that the social networks, among other things, are bringing, uh, we are stopping to think about surnames, uh, color of your skin, among other things. And we are thinking about more who the person is, how this person behaves, uh, what's the, what's the, the, what does he think, and, 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 and etc. So for me, going to a, a very important and formal corporate event dressing as I like to dress, it's basically being myself. It's basically not saying you will think I'm better just because I'm wearing a, 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 a suit, right? So so that, that's very good to listen from you. It, it more or less proves uh, how you think as well. Definitely, definitely. And I think that even not just our generation, but younger generations, they really do... Um, I think they really do take into account more and more, uh, you know, transparency and being real. I think we're just as a society, we're all a little tired of the, you know, filter washed images that we've grown up being used to. And I think that we're, we're going into more, into more of a, I would say real direction where it pays off to be your authentic self. So, That's, that's, I mean, I think we align on that, but Diego, I, I was wondering, um, so you're in Sao Paulo at the moment, but you're not originally from Sao Paulo, correct? I'm from the countryside of Brazil. It's a, a median city called Iberaba. Okay. So 
you're from the countryside in Brazil. Can you tell us a little bit more, just so the audience gets a feel for who you are and your upbringing, a little bit more about your upbringing, how you grew up, a little bit more about your family structure when you were a kid and so forth? Yeah, for sure. So I, I, I was born in, in Uberaba, which is uh, at that point in time, 200,000 people. Uh, so a median city uh, basically based on agriculture uh, in a very uh, built in a very traditional uh, uh, scheme, which means that uh, if you born if you were born in a certain family, you would be regarded mm -hmm. as a better person. You would have access to some possibilities in, in, in the city. If you were not, you were like you had to work hard to to, to reach that that same level of of, of, of the people. Uh, I I was born uh, with a lot uh, of of privileges. I, I I have to assume this. So I have never uh, had problem to feed myself. I I had the chance to study in the best school of the city. My family was a very structured family, so. My parents were great. My sisters, I have two sisters, uh, were great. Uh, we had our own problems, but far from, be, from being a real problem. So I had this chance to evolve as a consequence uh, of what I did and not as a consequence uh, and without having to deal with big challenges that certain people have in life, right? Uh, my parents were, are actually, but were at that point in time, uh, great people. Uh, my father is an entrepreneur who left a corporate job in Sao Paulo, moved to Uberaba, and he started a transportation company with his brother and his father. They built something relevant, not relevant in the sense that it's a big company and, 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 and becoming rich people. It's not about this, but relevance, relevant in the sense that they were able to build the structure to do everything that they could for our families, uh, uh, avoiding this kind of challenges that are that are common for some people in Brazil. Uh, my mother has never worked. She came from a privileged uh, family. Uh, she finished the, the, the school and decided to not go to the college because at that point in time, women were not, I would not say allow it, but they were not incentivized to go to college, right? So I, in, 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 in conclusion, I come from a, a very traditional way of growing up a family in the countryside of Brazil. The, 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 the man works, feed the family, and is responsible for everything. The woman uh, raised the, the kids, uh, educate and 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 live the life only for the house, right? Uh, when I was uh, 20 years old, I decided to move from Uberaba to São Paulo, and which was a big shock for for my parents. Uh, they didn't expect me to pursue uh, a big challenge in my professional career because I have never been a good student in the school. I, I was always uh, avoiding going to school, was always uh, did uh, what we call in Brazil second exams, which means that you don't pass in the first one, so you have to repeat. Uh, so I was terrible. So uh, at a certain point, something changed in my mind, and we can talk more about this later. And I decided to come to Sao Paulo. Uh, and when I came here, I... I, 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 I tried to go to the law school, which eventually I, 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 I got. And I'm telling this just to, to emphasize how we are in Brazil when we are young. My father uh, went to the law school and become, became an entrepreneur. In my mind and in his mind, this was a natural path for everybody. So if I went to the law school, I could be a business guy, right? Uh, but the reality is that as soon as I enter in the, in the college, I understood that would be impossible to do that because of the way we teach law in Brazil and how 
uh, uh, procedural we are here, but very well focused on, 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 on courts, proceedings and things like this, and not in restructuring ideas, business, and so on and so forth. So I, I come to Sao Paulo with actually a wrong decision in my mind without knowing this, and later I, I, I discovered. But in some, that's, that's, that's my life. That's really interesting. And uh, let me ask you, so you, you come from the interior of Brazil and for, for the audience that hasn't been to Brazil, Brazil is a huge country with different cultures from north to south, east to west. So what was your mindset leaving your hometown and moving to Sao Paulo, the big city, right? Um, what were you thinking? What was going through your mind? You know, when I, uh, when I look back, I can see myself always trying to do big things. Doesn't matter what, but it was a pattern, right? Doesn't matter if I was organizing a soccer uh, challenge championship in my my school, or if I was doing a project to be presented to a specific audience, or if I was going to my uh, father uh, company to work, I was always pursuing big things, always. Uh, when I, when I grew up, uh, in Uberaba, I went to the, to my father's company. So it was amazing for me at that point in time, it was exciting going there and, and, and doing real work, real stuff. My father never allowed me to go to the best, uh, uh, things in the first place. So I worked with, with trucks uh, fixing engines, uh, repairing uh, uh, tires, uh, 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 driving, not, not driving, but uh, traveling with, with some truck drivers. So I came from the, 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 the hard work. And then throughout the time, I started to do more administrative works and then commercial ones and, and so on and so forth. Uh, it was a dream for me to get that company that my father uh, 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 founded and bring that to a next level. It was always a dream. Uh, But after I would say my 15 years old, things started to get harder in in the business of my dad. And he started to tell us to communicate, don't don't wait for this company to be your future. Uh, Things are hard. You need to build a different path. You need to build something for you. You need to be independent. So that that struck me because it was like crashing the dream uh, of a of a kid that started repairing engines and was at a certain point start to go to like to a bank meeting, right? Uh, so when I when I reached 18, 19 years old, the decision in my mind was if I cannot do this thing here which is the company of my dad big, I need to do another thing big to make my dad be, be, uh, 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 be happy about the outcomes of my life. So I have to assume that the first uh, insight comes from the fact that I was trying to please him, not because he pressured me, but uh, maybe just because I loved him and I would know that he he would be like very, very happy, very, very, uh, 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 he he would feel powerful seeing his kid uh, doing something great as he did. Yeah, and proud. We we all strive to make our parents proud. It's just part of human nature. So that makes sense completely. So all of this is so interesting to me. So... Now I want to move a little bit forward. How did you then jump from that situation, right, as a teenager coming into young adulthood and walk us a little bit through the process to now getting to, um, you know, a a senior position, executive position, a very important position at a company like iFood, which I mentioned in, in the introduction. It's LATAM's fastest growing online food ordering and delivery platform. Is this how you would define it? Yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and like I mentioned also last year, you, you were awarded a deal of the year, right? Within the industry, which is a huge accomplishment, especially in the tech and the Latin American space. 
Um, and, and I feel like this business has also allowed for many Brazilians to become even more entrepreneurial. It's brought Brazilian firms online, which is very, very important um, in, you know, in the di regarding the direction that businesses are going in and providing these people with some kind of leverage and competitive advantage so that they can, you know, just at least compete on the world spectrum. I think that's really important. So from studying law to now <laughs> sitting in this VP strategy position, walk us through that journey. Yeah. Uh, Anna, uh, I went to the, to the college as, a, as an old guy. So what I'm trying to say here is when I joined uh, the law school, I was very mature and my mindset was very different from most of the people at that point in time. And I'm not saying this to say I'm better than somebody else. I'm just saying this because this was different. So let me give you one example. Uh, in Brazil, it's quite common to have a, a, a kind of party that you do every year where you uh, bring together all the, the, the main law colleges in the country to celebrate during three, four days your, your time in school, right? It's like the spring break for the Americans, but in Brazil it's a little bit different, but has the same, the same mood. Uh, in five years during the college, I went only once. So I'm, 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 I'm bringing this symbol to say, since the first day at school, I was thinking about how to grow, how to work, how to develop, how to understand better the world and so on and so forth. So th that's a very important thing, and, and, and you will you will understand why. So I entered the school, uh, and during the first semester, I see that I, I did the wrong decision. So this is not about like becoming an entrepreneur, a businessman, or something like this. This is about becoming a very traditional lawyer. Uh, and I say, okay, what do I do? Do I go back to study and try another college, uh, another course? Or do I try to find a new route here? So I decide to stay and look for a, a for a, 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 a an opportunity that that could give me a different path. One day I'm I'm just chatting with some friends at the school, and some and suddenly a, a guy comes. His name is Ricardo. I never forget his name, and he says, "Oh, I'm 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 going to an interview." I said, "Great." So. Where are you going? No, I'm going to Matos Filho. So for the ones who are not Brazilians, Matos Filho is the main law firm in Brazil, far, far yeah. from the other. Uh, and I say, oh, that's 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 really great. I mean, what are you trying? Uh, uh, and he said, no, I have an interview to work at the capital markets department. Back in 2001, uh, the capital markets in Brazil was this size, very, very small. Uh, and I say, well, capital markets, Jesus, this is great. I mean, th this is my dream. That, 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 that would be my chance to change my route. And he says, well, I hate capital markets. I don't see myself working. Uh, do you want to go in my, in, in, in my place? Do you want to get my chance? I said, well, for sure. So don't call them. I will just show up and I will talk to them. Okay. Okay. So I go to Matos Filho. And, and, and the HR person comes and says, Ricardo, can, can you enter? So I enter, not being Ricardo, but I enter and I, I perform the interview. Uh, and by the end of the interview, she says, okay, I like it, you, and I think you should talk to, to, to the lawyers that are responsible for this, for this job position. Uh, and so can we schedule? I say, of course, but I have to tell you one thing. So I'm not Ricardo. And, and the person laughs and I explain to them, to her, right? I mean, I say, I'm not here in, in bad faith. I'm it's just because this is my opportunity. If I called here to say, Ricardo doesn't want to go, I want to go. Probably you would say, send me the resume and let's see. And the resume doesn't change nothing. It doesn't mean nothing because we are in the first year of college. So what does a resume mean at, at this point in time? And she says, oh, I really appreciate how how aggressive in a good sense you were, uh, how courageous. Okay, let's move forward. And then 
I go to the other interviews and I, I, I was admitted there. So I start to work at Matos Filho and it was like great years. 2002, three, four were, were the years where Brazil for the first time entered in the global landscape, right? Brazil stabilizes the economy, China booms, Brazil starts to export, money comes to Brazil and everything happens here. Everything happens here. Uh, and at that point in time, there, there, there wasn't too many people working in the capital markets department in Brazil in general, which means that the ones who were there had the chance to see great things happening, being created. The first discussions regarding some types of deals, regulations, huge innovation in, in, in the legal space. It was unbelievable. It was great. And this, Anna, gave to me the chance to be in the spotlight. I was just an intern, but because there, there was a, a, a shortage of people in the capital markets, everybody that was there and was interested to do more and to perform well, gained spaces that currently you would never gain. Why? Because now you have too many people working in, in, in capital markets. You don't need to force this anymore. At that point in time, this gave me this space. And during my third year at Matos Filho, I was in the fourth year of, of, of the, uh, the, the law school. I, I was working in an IPO and suddenly the CFO, after we, we, we ring at the bell at the Brazilian Stock Exchange, he approaches me and, and says, so uh, when, when did you graduate? And I was, a, I was an intern. I was in the fourth year of the, the, the law college, has uh, five years. Uh, and I say, you know, I'm, I'm working at Matos Filho for three years. And, and he said, no, 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 I didn't ask this. I asked it, when did you graduate? And I said, no, actually, I didn't graduate. So imagine a CFO of a company being IPO'd, uh, paying a huge amount of fees, looking to an intern who did, of course, not the entire transaction, not lead the transaction, but it important parts of that transaction. And he says, Jesus. I go back to Matos Filho, I look for the senior partner and say, this happened. He says, don't worry, I mean, this is part of the risk because of what is going on in, right now in the industry. The CFO calls me one day later and says, Diego, can you, can you have lunch? Yes. And then we meet and he says, and he says you are not a lawyer at all. I mean, uh, come to work with me and uh, come to work in finance. Uh, I'm going to help you to make this transition. And you will be a, a much more happy person. And I, and I say to him on the spot, of course. I mean, I know you as well, but nobody knew before. <laughs> so, so I, so I so, sorry to interrupt you, Diego. So this is for, for the people at home watching. This is how you poach good talent. <laughs> exactly. That's, you, you find great people, right? You don't hire them in a job interview. That You're completely yeah. right, Anna. By the way, th this is a thing that I that I that I I would say a tool that I have today with me. Every time I find people performing in a way that that is brilliant, I approach this person, and at a certain point, I bring him or her to 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 my team. So I move them, and then I started to work in finance. The interesting thing here, Anna, is why I was in law school. I I study like crazy economics, accounting, and finance. So I, I, I dare people that went to the business administration college in Brazil that studied more than myself alone. And I tell this just to say uh, that the CFO that invited me to, 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 to do the career change didn't, that, uh, didn't, didn't do that because I'm more intelligent than the average. It's not about this. It's because I prepared myself. I work it hard. I work it alone because I didn't have the means at that point to study accounting, economics, and 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 and, and finance. So I went there, and then I start my career. I started to work hard uh, in, in 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 corporate finance. Things went quite well, and at a certain point, Anna, I got a call. Uh, I was 26 years old. And somebody calls me and says, well, uh, you were like, people told me about you. Uh, you were a lawyer. And at the same time, you were a finance guy. 
uh, you work at, in private and public companies, uh, we think you were like the person to come to our company. And I, I will, I will, I will not tell the company right now because there's a, in the end of the story, there, there, there is, there is something interesting here. So he calls me and says, come. And, and, and I go to the company, uh, big company at that point in time, like $3 billion revenue, a big company in Brazil, multinational. And basically they were a construction company that were transitioning to an infrastructure company, meaning that they were investing in concessions in infrastructure projects, not only rendering services, but also as an investors, they were going from Brazil to, uh, to foreign countries. Uh, especially in Africa and Latin America. Company was growing like hell. Uh, and I went there. Uh, when I'm 27 years old, I decided to go to the MBA. It was my second year at the at this company. Uh, I apply. I got admitted. When I got the, the, the admission letters, I go to the CFO and I say, and I say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving. And he said, Jesus, why? I say, I, I'm going to, to the MBA. I, you know that I'm like, I always consider this. And he said, no, 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 you can't go. I have a news to you today. I said, what? And he says, okay, you were the new CFO. I said, what? He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm just moving to be the CEO of one of our subsidiaries. And today I was calling you to say that you were the new director of finance. I was 27 years old and I say 27 years old. I graduated under, I got my undergrad three years before I was a lawyer (laughs) and he says, you were now the director of finance. I say, Jesus Christ. (laughs) So I, 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 I got the decision. I get, I got the decision to not go to the MBA. I stayed to leave this and see how it's having more responsibility reporting to the board. And, and, and be in charge of a, a, a large uh, budget and things like this. But I but I told them that at a certain point, I would consider to go again. One year later, I apply again to the school that I thought it was the best one for me, only for, mm-hmm. for this one, which is IMD in, in Switzerland. I got, I, I got admitted. I went there and I say, I'm going to the MBA. And now the CEO says, no, 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 you can't go. I mean, you can't go. And I say, why not? No, 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 no. We need you. We just finished our first bond transaction. Uh, the project finance are like booming. You are in charge of this. We cannot leave you. Uh, and I say, okay, I, I, I must go. And, and they say, okay, no. So give one, give one, give us one more year. I say, no. And they say, no, 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 no. Why not? I say, I, I cannot like try the GMAT again, do all the admission letters. I mean, this is, this is crazy. And they say, what, what about if they defer you for one year? And generally speaking, uh, MBAs, the top MBAs in the world, they don't have deferral policies. So I say, okay, you can try. If, if, if they give you, I, I, I spend one more year. here. So they call them, they call me back and say, we got the deferral. I said, Jesus, more one year. So, but the, the, uh, the condition there was you can go, uh, IMD told them, Diego can come one year later if you do all the process, including the payments right now, and the company decides to pay for you. So we are talking here about like $200,000, right? I mean, this is like a big thing, uh, especially on, at that point in time. So one year later, one week before going to IMD, the CEO calls me. Can you come to my to my, to my my class, to, to my to my office room, my <laughs> yeah. office and I go there and he says, okay, we want you to stay. And I say, no, Jesus, please. I don't want to stay. And he says, no, 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 but we have a proposal for you. You will be the new CEO of the real estate uh, uh, subsidiary. And I say, wow, I was 29 years old. Say, my God. And I decided to go anyway. So I went to my MBA, Anna. I left this opportunity. I went to IMD. I had a great year. Uh, I didn't pay the tuition. They paid my salary while I was there. Great MBA. I didn't have the pressure to find a job because I had a job. 
I didn't have the pressure of having a financing to finance the MBA. It was an amazing year. I dedicated a lot uh, uh, myself to that. One week before ending the MBA, I was in London doing a consulting project for the MBA. I leave the hotel. I enter in a taxi, uh, going to Heathrow, get my iPhone, open the news in Brazil. And the first news is uh, 32 executives in Brazil were arrested. And Brazil is knowing the car wash operation. I was working in one of the top three infrastructure companies in Brazil that were deeply involved in the car wash. So from as, the day, as the director of finance, mind you. Yes. yes. <laughs> from one day to another, my word collapses, right? Yeah. I start to call people in Brazil. Nobody answers. Uh, wow. My sister sends me a message. Are you involved on this? Another friend who is a lawyer sends me a message and says, I think it's better for you to stay in Switzerland because you can have immunity and things like this. So from one day to another, doesn't matter what you built in your whole life, people start to question if you are the person that they thought you were, right? It yeah. was like unbelievable. Uh, and then I, I had seven offers to stay in Europe working and I decided to come back and work for OAS, which is the company for, for whom I was working for six years. Uh, and why I decided to come back? Because there is one thing that most of the executives don't have experience, crisis management, real crisis management. Most of them, they leave and they go to a much simpler, easier and comfort job. I stayed, mm -hmm. I did at that point in time, I, I, was, I came back responsible for the restructuring of the company. I fired 40,000 people. I took the decision to leave 15 countries in three months. I took the decision to file for chapter 11. Uh, and then we approved the plan and, and the whole story ends well in, 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 in the sense that we were able to keep the company and, and, and maintain and, and reach an agreement with the, the, the creditors and, and so on and so forth. It was unbelievable. A great, great, great journey. I did a second MBA after this IMD when I when I when I took this this challenge before. I'm sorry, when I took this challenge, right? So doing everything regarding the car wash operation at OES was a second MBA. Uh, well, then I I got a call from Susano Papel and Cellulose, which is one of the, the largest companies in Brazil. They call me and say, okay, we are having a a change here in the company. We want a young people with a global mindset that had like experiences that are not common to find. We believe you were the right person. Come. I joined Susano. It was not a great journey for me. Uh, in the end, it was like uh, doing everything that I was doing before, doing bond transactions, the ventures in Brazil, uh, m and and finance, pure finance. It, it, it's great. But I mean, I came from IMD with a sense that the, the Brazil could be much different uh, and being different would be my responsibility as a person, as everybody here has this responsibility to change. And while I was at Suzano, I started to decide to mentor startups. It was like a, a great year doing this because it was funny how people was uh, receiving me and saying, oh, the director of finance of Suzano is coming here to mentor us. Jesus, this is an honor. And I, in, in my mind, I was, my God, these guys are like teaching me a lot. Like the way they manage, the way they work with, with product, the way they are agile, the way they use tech, the way they use data. I mean, we don't do that in big corporations in Brazil at all. So I yeah. actually was learning a lot with those guys while... They thought it, it was a honor to them, a honor to them being with me. It was totally the opposite. Yeah. Uh, one day, uh, Mavli, 
who is the 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 the, the controlling shareholder of iFood calls me uh, and says, I mean, we are becoming big, company is becoming complex. We need a person that can come and help you with us. But more than this, that has our mindset, that understands this new economy, that understands the power of tech, data, that understands the power of culture, and so on and so forth. So I take the decision to go, and then I join here the group six years ago. And since then, I'm in this journey here, uh, helping to build uh, 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 iFood. That's an amazing journey. And now it makes sense to me a little bit more why ethics does play such a huge role in your leadership style. So yeah. it's good to know this backdrop. We hadn't spoken about this story before, so now it's giving me a deeper sense of where that comes from. And we can get into that um, further along the conversation. But uh, knowing that you're, you're now at iFoods, which you mentioned the word new economy and you have released a book was it yep. last year that it came out so yep. the new economy right and the audience can can google um the book online can buy it online or any bookstores um that have that, that carry it um but i'd like for you to then define for us what it what is the difference between let's say the old economy and this new economy that you speak about so much. Yeah. So, Anna, uh, before I tell you, uh, I think it's important to say why I write about this, but more than this, why uh, I study about this. I study this. Uh, I always, uh, uh, I, 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 not always, but since the fourth year of law school, I'm a teacher. I love to teach. I don't make money. I mean, the the salary for a teacher in Brazil it's ridiculous. That that's that's definitely not uh, not uh, uh, the motivation. The motivation exactly that 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 makes somebody like me go to the to colleges. But anyway, I love this. So since the fourth year of law school, I'm teaching, uh, and from uh, as soon as uh, actually while my career was changing what I teach changed as well. So at a certain point, I went to finance and then to economics, leadership, and etc. cetera, uh, and strategy. So uh, when I was teaching economics, for me, it was unbelievable how traditional we were to explain to students how uh, they could change the country, how their ideas, how they could impact the decision leaders of the country through economics. And why? Because they, 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 they were studying the basics, right? I mean, the, the common sense, like microeconomics, microeconomics, GDP, supply, demand, and etc. And of course, you need to know that. But more importantly, what we need to teach people here is what we must change in our economic economy that will change the country in 10, 20, 30 years, right? So in the back of my mind, I started to think about this. I go to IMD and I, I was like, I was like amazed about how countries at that point were discussing technology, uh, the impact of technology in their economic matrix and how this impacted the, the, the society, the conditions of people to live, to have a well-being and, and so on and so forth. I come back to Brazil with this in mind. I started to develop some ideas and I remember the day I opened the Brazilian main business news, newspaper and there was written iFood 99, which is the Brazilian Uber, uh, 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 which is a, a, a kind of, 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 of pricing uh, tool for you to compare price in, in different uh, stores and things like this. And I said, Jesus, uh, who, what are the, these companies? So. I have never heard about them. And then I started to, 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 to study them and I learned a few things. First of all, they were like five years old. They were like built by very young people. They built with like a little uh, 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 amount of capital, a small amount of capital. And I said, how, how this is possible? And then it when a, a, a coin flips in my mind and I understand that the world and especially Brazil 
is starting a revolution that comes not from technology, but from digital technology, which is completely different from what we'll talk here. Technology, generally speaking, is a hardware, is heavy, is expensive. So I always give an example. When I was a young person in Uberaba, and at a certain point, I learned that there is something called DVD. It took like <laughs> seven years to come to my house. And I was a privileged people. And why? Because it's too expensive having a factory, transporting this, bringing this from a country to Brazil, and then transporting this to a store and so on. It's expensive. So what happens is technology, generally speaking, always goes to class A in the first years and then goes to class B and then goes to class C, meaning to the high income people, mid income people and low income people, right? Therefore, technology throughout the years actually concentrate power in the hand of people that has money, that has political power, that has economic power. What changes here is that digital technology enables everybody to access everything. So let's get the best example of what is going on right now. Everybody in the world is talking about chat GPT, LLM model, right? Everybody, not yep. the rich people, everybody. The 15 years old guy in Uberaba right now is getting the same application that's the, uh, 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 that the wealthiest person in Portugal. Yep. At the same time, that's the change. And when, Anna, the tool, the code, the resources become available to everybody, doesn't matter how much money you have in your banking account, it starts to change completely the economy. And that's why a company at that point in time, such as iFood, Not99, and Buscapé, were being born. Why? Because people who realized that didn't need money, didn't need power, didn't need political connections and things like this. And then we started to talk about startups in Brazil. And that's what is the new economy. The new economy is the capacity to converge multiple, multiple digital technology in your business model. And while doing this, transform your value proposition, change the value chain and make scalable business. In the past, that was not possible. The old economy was industry oriented, supply chain oriented. It was heavy, capex oriented, capital intensive oriented. So the difference here is that people are building business right now with these resources that are available. What we are doing right now here, Anna, 10 years ago would not be possible. You would be in your house right now looking for a traditional job just to pay your bills. What you are doing right now is getting a dream, is getting a, 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 an intention that you have and saying, I have the means. It doesn't cost me too much. I'm going to try. It can be a huge failure. doesn't matter. The point is, you can try. 10 years ago, you would never have the chance to try. And that's what the new economy is. That's what iFood is. iFood, in the end, Anna, is just a company that is started in a garage with a few people coding and then building a huge and complex system around it, enabling people in mom and pop stores that don't have the money to build a second, third, fourth, fifth store but has the chance now to deliver in the same radius of the second, third, or fifth store. So instead of getting their savings and risking this in a second, third, or fifth store, they are just delivering through digital technology. Yeah. Now they can drink, they can be bigger than they thought before. And this is what means the new economy. Definitely. And, and it's a huge reach also that the possibilities are endless. The reach is endless. Um, so that's, I think it's something really positive that you and iFoods represent in a building and and more of this would be amazing to see, not just in Brazil, even here in Portugal, I would love to see more of this mindset and entrepreneurship um, being developed. But I have another question for you around this. So 
Do you feel like at the end of the day, this is shifting the culture so that this digital transformation, this scalability that comes with it, do you feel like that's shifting actually the culture in Brazil at the moment? Completely, Anna. Completely. And it's beautiful to see. Of course, the, it, it will not change in one, two, three, four, five years. This is a cultural change. And cultural change take 10, 20 years to, to, to be consolidated, right? But what is going on now, Anna, is because resources are available and they are cheap for you to reach and try, people, people are closer to freedom, right? So yeah. think about, think about, I'm going to give you a few examples. Think about the writer that works for iFood today. This writer now can go every single morning to his or her children's school and, 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 and without, go to the children's school and bring them every single day to the school because they can decide when to start work. They can stop on Wednesday, end of afternoon, because it's when we traditionally watch soccer games in Brazil television. They can stop to work to watch the games that they want. In the traditional way of working, these people didn't have the chance to take these decisions. They had to wake up at 4 a.m. to get the bus and go to the factory that they were working and didn't have the chance to bring their kids to school. A second example of this is people now has much more flexibility. For example, Ana, traditionally in Brazil, where we work, where we hire people in Sao Paulo. So do you want to work for me? Come to Sao Paulo. You must live in Sao Paulo. So do you want to work for a big company? You must come to Sao Paulo. <laughs> no, that's not an issue anymore. Right? We have... 500 people, which means 10% of my company, living outside Sao Paulo. We have people living in Portugal. We have people living in France. We have people living in the US. We have people living in different countries, in different places. You call them and you ask, why don't you come to Sao Paulo? And some say, oh, my wife, she's a public servant. She can't change the city. So I have to stay here. So I'm making this person happier. This person can have the career where he dreamed and at the same time respect her wife because she is also having the career where she dreamed yeah. and she can change the city. Yeah. At the same time, Anna, I'm seeing more and more people leaving companies and building business. Oh, but sometimes they fail. Of course, of course. Life, it's always uncertain. It's always hard and you always have to work. Of course, it, this will never change. But the difference is about feel, feeling that freedom is closer. People are trying. And if they don't so succeed and want to come back, they are more than welcome. Another thing, Anna, every time that you think about an influencer in your, in your social network, you must think that this person in front of you is an entrepreneur. It's an entrepreneur that don't want the traditional jobs. It's an entrepreneur that want to communicate. They want to build content. They want to entertain people. Doesn't matter what she or he does. Doesn't matter. It's not my problem. But if there's an audience to pay her, to pay him, why not? Why should I go to a normal routine uh, of a company? So this completely changing everything. Anna, think about how culture now, now it's much more decentralized. 20 years ago, yep. you had three main uh, uh, channels in the Brazilian uh, TV. You had like 10 main radio uh, 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 stations in, in Brazil. And, 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 and I don't know, five newspapers and 10 big uh, 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 magazines. Yep. Now you don't have 10 anymore. If you want to build your culture, if you want to release this, if you want to... Uh, uh, talk to your audience and explain about economics. You don't need to wait 20, 30 years to have uh, an opportunity in a big TV channel. The main, listen this, the main 
sport t- a channel in Brazil today is made by a very young person who broadcast Brazil soccer on YouTube. Wow. Million people watch him networking soccer at YouTube. Wow. He doesn't wait an opportunity in a big network anymore. This is freedom. This is cultural change. And this is empowering people to believe that they now own much more than future, their future, than the traditional ways of the of the past. Definitely. And 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 it's where we're headed. Um it's we we have the ability now to curate our content we have the ability now to i mean we have access to so much information but we do have the ability to select what speaks to us what doesn't and at the same time that also empowers us you know in terms of what direction we go in what paths we we decide to 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 go down in our lives and i think um it is definitely very empowering to to have that flexibility to have that autonomy at the end of the day you know we are adults and and to think that our parents i don't know 40 years ago lived under such a strict and rule based um system it's it's nuts to me because we kind of grew up in that also you know we were born in the 80s we do come we we are children of that but i think maybe that's also what's propelling us to move in um, a more freeing, more authentic direction. So agree with everything that you said. (laughs) And I was wondering also from, so from, you know, such an interesting story um, you've had throughout your life and so much more to come, but um, I'd love to get the words from you um, and the insight from you of what you consider to be a good leader and how ethics really does play into that in a real way because we, we hear so many leaders and executives speak about, you know, sustainability, ESG, um, ethics, diversity, but how do you really feel that these things are important and the, that these things truly do make great leaders. Yeah. So, Anna, uh, well, the first part here, being a good leader, in my opinion, is being quite honest with yourself that you will not reach uh, an unanimous status. People will not love you in general. People will not support you in general. And that's very important. Leadership, it's about changing the status quo. Leadership, it's about building something new in a direction that most people don't believe. Leadership, it's about seeing a challenge that most people can surpass and try again and again and again and again and again. So it's not being about a good guy. In, in, in not a good guy in a sense that you're a good person, but a good guy in the sense that everybody loves you. Leadership, it's about tough decisions. So that's the first aspect. The second aspect is, even though you will not be unanimous, you must, you must own the trust of everybody. You must and the way you earn trust, it's about caring to there afterwards. So you earn trust when people believe you are close, when people believe you care them, you care about them. When people see you going one step forward to reach them, to make them happy when it's possible to be happy. And to reduce pain when it's possible to reduce pain. So you must care then to there. If you are able to care and then there, you will never be unanimous. But on the other hand, you will earn trust from people. And what I think, Anna, is that traditionally leaders, they sit on the top and 
they just work with command and control. So let me give you a few examples here. Uh, I talk to everybody from my team during the year, everybody. And I have like 350 people with me. I, I, I talk to everybody, everybody I sit individually, which means Anna, that I have on an average, I have to do that every single day. Every single day, I have to have one hour here to talk to a different person. Because if I have 250 people, I don't have other way to do that. Yeah. But I do. I know everybody by their names. I know everybody by their names. I know what happened with them. And you know why this is important? Anna? Because yeah. you, when you make these conversations, you don't have like a magic trick to do on the spot. But at a certain point, you are walking or you get a telephone call and somebody tell you something that you say, oh, this is important to Anna because I remember when we talked that she was looking for something like this. And then I make the connection and mm -hmm. Anna look at me and say, oh, he care about me. He remember everything that I told. And as soon as he saw an opportunity to me, he make the connection. You're so I'm going to give you two you're authentically Please. also, so you, you're empathetic, empathetic and you're authentically creating value for the people that surround you. Totally. So I'm going to give you one simple example. Uh, I work hard in diversity here. I, I believe on this. The company believe on this. I, I, I study this and etc. cetera. So uh, two weeks ago, one person from our team uh, uh, who is a, is a black a woman, uh, approach me and says, oh, Diego, I have a great news to tell you. I said, what is? So I, I just got admitted in an LLM in Bristol, England. I said, oh, that's great. And she said, yeah, but now I'm applying for 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 support because I, I don't have enough enough money to, to pay. So, Sienna, I cannot just come to iFood and say, let's pay her LLM because there are like thousand people doing this and there, there's not enough money for all of them, right? But I can do one thing. So I told her, who are the people in charge in the admission process? And who are, uh, uh, what is the fund that is supporting potentially your, your tuition? So she gave me the contacts. I called them and I said, my name is Diego. I'm the CFO of the company. I know her quite well. She's this, this, and that. It's very important for her to go. The impact that she will have if she gets the, the LLM in Bristol, in Brazil, is this, this, and that. And I really believe you must consider her. We don't have the, the answer yet. I don't know if she will get the support. But one thing I know, she will never forget this because it doesn't take me five minutes to make this call. And every time then th that I go and dare her because we have our challenges here, she will accept much better. No. She will not love me because of this, but she will understand that I care and I dare at the same time. She will respect you so, because you match your words with your actions. Exactly. And this is trust. A and that's what leadership is about for me. Leadership is not, it's not about people loving me. It's not about... I have to dare people, but before I have to care. Uh, and then, Anna, going to the second part, uh, I think most of people that talk about all the aspects that you mentioned, ethics, diversity, among other things, are liars. They are liars. Controversy. They we I, have I love this. Controversy. Please. Tell tell me, why do you think these people are liars? And I think I know where they you're going liars. with this. <laughs> Anna, they don't study that. They don't know what they're talking about. If you sit down and go to the second page, they intellectually are not able to go to the second page. Yeah. They don't really understand. They just repeat the phrases that they have to memorize and repeat in front of everybody else. Because today, you cannot say things like, I don't care about different races. I don't care about minorities. I don't care about woman empowerment and things like this. They can't say, right? Society doesn't respect people that say this kind of things. So people, they just have to say, no, I support all of this. Bullshit. 
most of people that I know, they tell that in front of everybody. But when they are in the restaurants discussing, they say, I really don't care. I think people is exaggerating and things like this. It's bullshit. They're lying. They And I, I can tell you, that's... I love to read, right? And I yeah. always have books here. So that's the books that I that I read here. Like How Racism Created Brazil, How the Brazilian Elite uh, Brings Brazil to the Past, How Our Mid-Class Are Not Helping Us. I study. You have receipts. I come from a tradition. You have the receipts. Of course. <laughs> I, I, I come, Anna, I come from a traditional country. I come from a traditional family. I come from traditional thoughts. My education was traditional. How can I be a person that come to the audience and talk about <laughs> things if I don't study, if I don't think about this, this new trends and how we interpret all of this? I'm serious that you will come and talk about woman empowerment being educated by the dads we were educated i love my dad he's a great guy but when i look to him right now and think about how life was 20 30 years ago he was a terrible person N not in a bad sense that he was terrible uh, uh, in bad faith but the the aspects the values of that time is something that doesn't talk to myself today yeah but the only way for me to realize this is studying, is learning, is listening. So that's why I think all these aspects that we brought are important, but most of the people don't know what they're talking about. They don't go to page two to have deepness to talk about this. And, and I think that I agree with you very honestly. I very much agree with you. Um, I, I share the same opinion as you. I come, I'm, I'm ethnic. My father is from Angola, also comes from an ex-colony that was colonized by the Portuguese. Let's just call a glass a glass. The Portuguese colonized many countries, including Brazil. Um, my mother is Portuguese, so I'm mixed and, and I'm a woman, right? So obviously I'm a minority twice. <laughs> Double, double the times. <laughs> so I'm ethnic and I'm a woman. Um, and this brings me to my next question to you that might touch on a more, um, I would say, sensitive subject, but we've had this conversation before. You know that one of my main intentions with this podcast is also to create very transparent and real conversations with the leaders and the guests that I bring on. And for that, I, you know, I want to make sure that I create this safe environment, that I build this repertoire with, with my guests um, and make you guys feel safe. But, and I thought it was really interesting. So I came across that TED Talk um, presentation that you did around sexism. So for, for the guys, to the people at home watching, the audience at home watching and, and listening to us, if you Google this um, on on YouTube, or if you look for it on YouTube, search for it on YouTube. So Diego uh, was brave enough and honest enough to put together a, a short TED talk that translated to English is something entitled, it sounds something like, the moment I realized I was a sexist was in my own home. It was something like this. And I yeah. came across this TED Talk and I said, more men to have the courage to, like I said before, call a glass a glass. Let's just, we live in a patriarchy and most men are just inherently sexist or have some kind of sexism within them, be it intentional, intentional or not. So I wanted to ask you first and foremost, what do you consider to be what do you consider sex, sexism to be? How do you define it? Anna, uh, the, the, the most simple way to define this is basically maintaining patterns that you learn throughout your life, right? If we agree there is an elite, there is much more men in power, uh, among other things, uh, the, con the, the social consequence of this 
is that patterns are built to respect this power, to respect this structure. Therefore, being sexist, it's basically maintaining these patterns. So if you want to evolve, you have to change the pattern. Which pattern? Doesn't matter. Choose one and start to work on this. So how should I be? Doesn't matter. I'm not here to teach anybody. I'm not a specialist on this. The only thing I know is that the pattern that my father, my father taught me is not the pattern anymore. So I'm going to give you one simple example. My oldest sister didn't went, didn't go uh, to the college outside Uberaba. Why? Because my father thought it was not okay for a girl with her age to go to other city, to Sao Paulo, for example. But I did. Because you're so the man. Because you're the man yes. and she was the girl. girl. And he's conservative. Of course, of course. Of course. And see, I'm talking about a person that is a great guy, great heart, that respects everybody, that reads a lot. However, he is a consequence of the patterns that he uh, uh, got from his father, my grandfather. Right? The only way to not be a sexist is to change the patterns. So uh, 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 it's as simple as that. Yeah, I agree with you. And and that, I, I'm sorry, Anna, but just to say, and that's what I say in, 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 in the TED Talk, right? At, at a certain moment, I say, well, there's something strange here. I mean, why this is happening? This is not rational and I'm doing. I mean, this is wrong. So I have to change, right? Uh, and, and this is what the TED is about. <coughs> Excuse me. So you believe that even to some extent at this point to how far we've come as a society that actually comes um, uh, unconsciously to men at, at certain levels. You don't do it intentionally. Is that what you're saying? Totally. That's scary. So, so Anna, I, <laughs> that's very frightening. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, you know, that's, that's a scary, but at a certain point it brings hope. And why I'm saying this? It's scary because it means that we have a lot of patterns in our chip, in our brain, and we just perform it, right? Yeah. But because I'm do unconsciously, there's one good thing on this. It's not in bad faith, right? In bad faith, it's when I know I'm doing something bad, and I decide to do that thing. So the good thing here is that every time that you come to me and say, Diego, have you ever realized that you do this? And mm -hmm. I say, wow, oh, oh, I, I never imagined this. Yeah, but pay attention. And then I pay attention. And then in one month, two months, three months, I say, oh, that's true. What Anna said is real. So is now my uh, 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 chance to change this. Right, so that's that's the good thing of being unconscious, but it's scary. I I understand you. Yeah, and I think the the important thing here that you that you're relaying is that um, if you're open to listening, if you're opening to observing yourself, because no one here is perfect, be it male, female, we're all human beings. We we all have you know qualities and 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 things to to improve on. No one here wants to be perfect. Um, but I think that's the important thing that, that I've gotten out of, um, the conversations I've had with you is that you're willing and you're open to listen. You're open to doing the work on yourself and, and self-evolving and, and growing. And so you're very conscious that way, but I feel like maybe you might be an exception, hopefully in the near future, not. Um, so that's why I think it's really important that. You have this TED Talk that we speak about, you know, these topics um, here on the podcast and not have it be such a taboo and not have also men be so afraid of, you know, just realizing and being able to acknowledge that, hey, listen, maybe this isn't the right attitude. Maybe I need to shift my perception. Maybe I need to shift my behavior. And that's okay. I think that's how we evolve. So I really do appreciate you kind of having the courage and the decency to have these conversations. But I wanted to ask you, I'm actually curious to know 
in which situation, in which moment did you actually realize you were a bit of a sexist yeah. <laughs> at the time? <laughs> so, Joanna, I can tell you like hundred uh, situations. Mm. I will tell you the one I talk in the TED talk. Uh, the one there was during the pandemic. Oh. So I was, during the pandemic, uh, two things changed dramatically, right? Among mm -hmm. other things, of course. Mm -hmm. The first one is I stayed more at home. And the second thing is we were using much more delivery, right? So for the first time in my life, I was sitting in this chair and at the same time, listen the 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 ring uh, 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 indicating that somebody arrived with a package, a book, food, among other things. So the it, it was strange because every time that I listened the ring, something called my attention, but then disappeared. Like in, in, in it was a very short reaction, and I just continued to perform my work. Mm -hmm. And this has started to happen frequently, every, like three, four days, f four times a day. And at a certain point, I asked myself, why, why, why something happens that calls my attention here? And at the same time, I never stand up and, and, and go there. So I started to think about this. And then I got a piece of paper and a pen. And every time that this happened, I started to mark to see how many times this happened. And like... Two weeks went, and I said, "Jesus, there are a lot of risks, my marks in my in my paper," and uh, and I started to think, and the conclusion was very simple: why the bell rings, and I don't stand up and go? Because historically, in my home, in my parents' house, my father continues to watch TV. And my mother goes there. Wow. So in my mind, unconsciously, it's not my responsibility to wake up, not, not wake up, but to stand. My responsibility to continue to work because I'm the man who feeds the house. Mm -hmm. Right? And that's a, a very simple example of a pattern that if you don't think about it, you will just continue to perform. So there's not bad faith. In yeah, doing this, but I didn't realize until I paid attention, and that was a great exercise because more and more now I think about this as small, like we call this blink. There's mm -hmm. in science, all this blink, it's when your brain is trying to tell you something, but it's so fast that you don't think about it, right? But if you if you got if you get sensible to this you start to see more patterns going on. And, and, and since then, I'm, I'm like, I'm realizing this, like every single month, I, I find a new pattern that I, I try to change afterwards. It's amazing. And, and it's so interesting that these little small acts that we might usually not think might be sexist or might be, you know, discriminatory, they actually are. Never, you know? Yeah. It's interesting to think about and, and for you to catch yourself this way in these situations, I mean, you do read a lot of books, but what other tools do you use in your life, in your daily life to, let's say, do this um, self-work, to do this growth on yourself? Uh, two things. I read like hell. Mm -hmm. So I, I teach myself through books. That's the first thing. I read like hell, like two, three books a month. So no. as I show here, I can show you more like five books that I'm going to read in the next like weeks. Wow. And, and, and why is it so important, Anna? Because reading, it, it's, a, it, it's a good moment to reflect, right? When you watch TV, uh, there are images. You think about very, uh, different signs that appear in the screen, you don't focus to reflect. You focus to learn, which is different from reflect. So I read a lot. That's the first thing. The second thing is I'm an active listener. Very. I'm developing this more and more and more and more and more. I'm an active listener. 
I listen more and more. So if I'm reading about something that I have to learn, and at the same time, I'm an active listener from listening from people that are the ones who are being impacted. So I learn a lot. So I would say that's my two main tools that I that I use here on, on a constant basis. Mm, interesting. And how do you how do you feel that this internal work has positively affected your personal life, your relationships at work? Um, you're also the father of three, if I'm not mistaken. So how yeah. how has how does <laughs> this consciousness um, and this work that you do on yourself really affect your whole life? And uh, many many impacts. Uh, the first one, and it's it's it, it, it's a tough one, is now I know better how to decide who I want close to me right i mean the, the more the more the more you get conscious the more you decide who you want to close to you yeah so that's the first thing so the relationships that i have changed a lot throughout this journey because i i really just don't wanna people that are conscious about something and decides to continue to do a bad thing so it's not about being radical or not having dialogue. It's not about this at all, at all. No. It's about deciding who you want to influencing you. Yeah. It's about this. So that's the first thing. The second one is changing the habits of mind with my kids. So the the habits that I have to choose what to do how to do, uh, what to watch, uh, uh, expose them to certain contents, among other things, uh, became an exercise because unconsciously, you just get the control and 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 and, and, and play, right? But when you are conscious about this, you have to reprogram everything. So, what cartoons to watch, right? What books to buy. Uh, what symbols to send them, what signals to send them. So it, 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 you really have to reprogram and actively decide what to do and how to do. So I'm going to give you one simple example. My oldest one is nine years old and he's a boy. So I am him do a lot of things as part of our routine that generally speaking was meant to be uh, actually was done by women historically. So I do, I actively decided to do a few things and he has to do as well. Therefore, when he was 18 years old, for him it will be natural to not ask for a few things, but to do these things, right? But this is about reprogramming. If you're not active on this, it's tough. And the last thing, Anna, is uh, among others, one that I told you, but just to prioritize, is to be patient to change people. Like when, when, when you are conscious that you are ahead of your time, you have to be patient to bring people along. If you are not patient, you become a radical person. If you are not patient, you don't transform people. You don't lead people. If you are not patient, you don't change the society. You don't change your community, your country. So I'm, I'll, I, I have a huge patience to work on this, to know that people will not realize this from one day to another, but they will do small steps if you, especially for the ones that you are more or less a kind of role model or you have a great influence or things like this. And, and in my opinion, that's how you create a, 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 a real wave that, that change that impacts your community. Correct. 
also agree on all of that. I think it's it patience is a skill that I'm just still learning. <laughs> I've gotten better at it, but it's it's a major skill to have for sure. Being it uh, as a leader, being it as a friend, just being you know a centered, well-rounded human being, it's something that I think we all need to to learn a little bit more of patience. Um, but thank you for sharing your thoughts on that. And it's great to hear that, you know, you're really, um, applying yourself and, uh, devoting yourself to, to, to bringing up and, um, uh, raising well-rounded human beings, I guess. Mm -hmm. So congratulations. Yeah. Congratulations to you and the wife. Um, let me ask you, so from all, you know, this whole conversation that we've had, it seems to me that, you know, uh, your personal growth is, is constant. You're, you know, at the top of your game in terms of career. Um, but share with us, you know, a challenge you're going through at the moment, because nothing is perfect in life. <laughs> no, nothing, 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 nothing. Well, actually, everything that I told you came with a huge burden and and now we we celebrate these achievements and things like this but came with a with a with a, a, a great burden uh i have many challenges and uh, i would say that the the biggest one is my parents are getting old uh and my father especially is starting to have problems with memory oh. is starting to deal with situations where he gets embarrassed by the fact that he's telling the same thing twice three times and so on and so forth and this is this is a, a very big challenge I, I i'm gonna tell you why uh first of all because you start to to demolish uh dreams that you had like travels that you were expecting to do uh celebrations that you were waiting waiting for the right time to celebrate and with this happening actually these things must not happen anymore right so you demolish this you you you, you, you destroy this kind of things and actively again you have to think about new things that not necessarily excites you individually but it's what is affordable for the relationship with a with a person that is is having this this first signs the second uh, thing on this challenge is you cannot control the whole environment right i can tell you as an adult to be patient with my father but how can i tell to my kids with nine years old or five years old or one year and a half to say don't tell your grandfather that he's repeating for the third time you can't control this you can work on it but can't control yeah. i can control you in that sense because you're an adult i ask you you understand you are sympathetic and then you can you will do that yeah. but i can't do that with yeah. it uh which means that the turbulence will happen every no. time uh the third thing is but when it's time to step in and start to control somebody else's life because this person is lacking the capacity to do that when when is time there's no right time no that's there's no right time I mean, when, when, when do you cross the line where you don't realize that that people should be independent anymore and now should be dependent? More than this, this person will never say, okay, I can be dependent. Now tell me everything that I should do. So it will be a conflict. Yeah. So you change a great relationship that you built during 40 50 years to a conflict yeah to a conflict that is necessary so see see the dilemma the dilemma is it's terrible yeah it, it, it's a terrible dilemma, terrible dilemma 
So I would say that this is my my main challenge uh, nowadays. Uh, I'm learning. It's the, the beginning of the process. I'm studying a lot. I'm talking to a lot of people that is going on through this for more time, and it's, they are teaching me a, a bunch of things. But the conclusion until now is that it, 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 it will be tough. It yeah. will be very tough. <laughs> yeah, and um, I guess... I guess what I wanted to, to know from you is how, how you're managing to integrate all of this um, within yourself because it's, it's an unnatural change of dynamic what you're, what you're uh, explaining. It's where you're, you're a son, you have a father whom you had an amazing relationship for X many years and now the dynamics change out of need, out of health, out of safety. And in that change of dynamics that come out of love from your end as a son, um, you end up maybe feeling a little more distanced from the person that you love the most, right? Um, or your first male figure in your life. So it's, it's, an, it's truly an unnatural dynamic. We're not used to, we don't talk about these situations um enough but how how are you um managing to integrate um the situation within yourself uh and uh i'm it's 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 been tough to manage uh the first phase was denying which is not integrating right yeah but but I, I denied it a lot. Like it, it, it makes me feel sad. I have, I want to cry. Yeah. Uh, because even though you manage, you are losing, right? Yeah. It, it's different when you manage to continue to gain. It's a loss. You, manage, you, f- you, you feel it as a loss. loss. Exactly. It is a loss. Uh, I, I will make things being good. Uh, we're going to like, live different situations, uh, but it, it it's a loss. So it, it took like one year for me to be more more pragmatic about what's, what's going on. Uh, I I'm 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 working hard to respect him. Uh, and one of the ways for for example to respect which is difficult is like Every time that he now says a thing that he just told me like a day before, mm-hmm. I listen with the same care of the first time. Like it's the I first listen. time. It's the first time you're like hearing it. Time. Exactly. Exactly. And for your mind, this is crazy because your reactions it, are, are, should not be the same. Yeah. But I'm working hard to be the same. Uh, and and I'm trying to make this natural. It's not natural yet, yeah. But I'm I'm, I'm gonna make it natural. That's that that that's how I'm gonna make him happy. Doesn't matter what he's he's having, right? Yeah. So I'm 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 trying to integrate now, being more pragmatic. And again, it's about being active in organizing yourself, uh, organizing your feelings, organizing your reactions mm-hmm. to make everything work. Uh, so that, that's how I'm trying, but I, 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 I'm not there yet to say it working. Definitely. And, um, I appreciate you being vulnerable and sharing, you know, this is very personal. And so I appreciate you, you, you having, you know, the courage to be vulnerable and share this part of, you know, your life right now with us. Um, I wasn't so aware of this, but I'm sure I know that you will be able to, come out on the other side a stronger better person and maybe we can speak about this in a year's time you will definitely be in a better spot by then and you can you can share with us maybe the process you went through um with yeah. this particular um theme um but i guess i don't know i think we're we're coming to unfortunately i wish we could stay here for a few more hours because we have so many i have so many questions to ask you but I guess what I'd, I'd like to know from you is, you know, you've been an executive, 
um, all your life, you've studied hard, you've traveled, you have a beautiful family. What would you be doing if you weren't, you know, um, in finance, uh, if you weren't the VP of, you know, I, of strategy at iFood, what would you be doing? And give us an answer that's completely maybe out of what we would think you would answer. Uh, I would be the uh, the president of Brazil. <laughs> I would go for politics. Uh, I would try to change this country. I would fight against uh, this crazy, insane people that destroy people's life that's what i would be doing <laughs> guys you heard it here diego Barreto might be coming for lula <laughs> i'm joking <laughs> it's a joke <laughs> or maybe not we don't know um so you'd be in politics that's interesting what's what's keeping you from pursuing that i mean i think it seems like a pretty you know i hate the word realistic but it seems like a pretty doable dream no? Yeah, it's it's realistic, I think. Uh, I think there are two things. One is temporary, but the other one is is, is structural. The the temporary one is I I, I have to finish my journey here at iFood. There are some mm -hmm. things that we that I want to conclude before uh, leave iFood and probably the corporate world and maybe okay. never be here again in the corporate world. Uh, but the the second thing which which is structural i don't think my family would live well uh with me being in politics changing from moving from sao paulo it's it's would be tough uh spending so much time outside our daily routines here would be tough and yeah. the public exposure uh, would be tough as well so yeah. so i think that's that's what will probably keep me far from this but Maybe I can find a solution. Let's see. I'm here. We're here to to watch the whole journey. So can't wait for what's coming next. <laughs> <laughs> Diego, um, throughout your throughout your journey thus far, you must have come across, you know, and I know you've come across many interesting human beings. What's the best piece of advice you have received? read books uh it it looks it looks simplistic but it's not i mean especially for the ones who are not brazilians bear in mind that we 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 don't read many books in brazil it's not part of our culture it's not part of our of our habits so mm -hmm. i i mm -hmm. learn uh since the beginning that I could reach another level uh, of consciousness if uh, books would be my my best friends, and and that's what I do. Okay. So there are a bunch of books here. Uh, so that's that's. I mean, again, looks a, a very silly advice, but for a Brazilian, this is like um, amazing. Like like having the chance to continuously study. Right, we and, and that's an aspect that is important here, Anna. Uh, 20, 30 years ago, we study in cycles. So you were in a school, mm -hmm. and then you stop. Mm -hmm. Then you go to your college, then you stop. And at a certain point, you decide to do an extension, an MBA. You study, you stop. Uh, today, the knowledge is available. Interesting people is available, yeah. and so on and so forth. So it's reading today it's much more important because the gap between what you are and what you could be it's much easier to be closed right now mm -hmm. uh when i was in uberaba there was not a bookstore there wow there was a library but a library doesn't have the books i want to read necessarily <laughs> but a bookstore maybe Today, everybody in Uberaba can read what they want. And before they move to Sao Paulo, as I did when I was 21 years old, they can be much more prepared in many aspects because they had the chance to read constantly. Yeah. The access is different. 
So read books, we have to go back to basics. So then let me follow up with, with this question. What's the best piece of advice you want to leave our audience with specifically, you know, um, the younger generation, minorities, um, people that come from different types of backgrounds, um, ambitious, you know, human beings that want to, to get to the next level in their journey. What, what piece of advice what, do you leave what, for them? What, 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 well, I, I would tell them that uh, we are in a in a cycle with profound changes, uh, and this will be this will be much deeper in the next years, especially because of the the the, the, the rise of artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. It will impact how we work, ethics. It will impact habits. It will impact relationships. It will impact a bunch of things. Uh, we will have to reinterpret uh, all these concepts. What is ethics when there is an algorithm deciding what to do? Hmm. Right? What is what is respect when uh, people now, the minorities that are radical, can join themselves to push against something? So there are many changes that we will need to reflect on. So it's it remembers remembers me the role that the cities in Greece had thousands of years ago when philosophy arrived and we started to discuss the concepts and establish concepts for the modern life of that time, and that like endured for. Uh, 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 years, so I think it's it's time for us again to bring the philosophers the philo philosophers back, the study the fundamentals, uh, and uh, and work on the concepts again. So again, back to basics. We should go back to basics. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Guess we have all of the tools we need, huh? Yeah. Perfect. Well, here at the business of being Diego, um, we really truly believe that, you know, no journey to success is the same. We all have our own journey. Journeys can, you know, are different for each human being. So that prompts me to end this conversation with a question that I pose on to every single guest that we bring on, which is what's an attribute that makes being you unique? Anna, can you can you just repeat, please? I just, it just cut. Sorry. So uh, we would love to end this this conversation with. So it's the same question for every single guest, and the question is: What's an attribute that makes being you unique? It's my anti fragility. I don't know <laughs> if you ever heard this concept of being anti anti fragile, but it's basically the 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 the, the opposite of being fragile. It's not about hard, strong, resistant. It's about uh, receiving the impact, learning from this, and getting stronger uh, with this. So the, also the, the, the um, trying to describe this in one word, but difficult to describe it in one word. We'll come up with a yes. word, but... Um, Basically, yes, but there's a, there's so, a and, great book, yeah, that's called Anti Fragile. Okay, it's the and Anti Fragile, it's not a word, it was invented to explain this concept, mm -hmm. and it was written by uh, Nassim Taleb, which is uh, a great mathematician and, wow. and, and also, I would not say a philosopher, but uh, you can, in, in, in modern concept, you, 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 you may consider him. So, it's, it's a great book that, that explains this. Amazing, amazing. I think I think we've learned a lot throughout this whole conversation, Diego. And I once again I really want to thank you for coming on, sharing your journey thus far with me and the audience. I think at home, um, everyone watching will have great takeaways um from your story. And yeah, just to I guess to end this conversation, I'd love to Give the mic and the center stage to you. Let us know where we can find you on the socials, what you're up to at the moment. 
in your life, career, what you want to tell the public, over to you. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Anna, uh, first of all, thanks very much. It was a great pleasure to be here. It's a uh, it's, uh, insightful, thoughtful conversation, different from all the others that I that I that I have done. I, I, I did like, I don't know, 30, 40 podcasts. All of them repeats more or less the same thing. So that's the first one that is different. So congratulations for, for hosting this. Uh, well, people can just write Diego Barreto on Instagram or LinkedIn. You can find myself there. Uh, my book was recently translated and distributed by Amazon. So it's also in, in, in English. For, so for the ones that want to understand more the concept of the new economy, uh, uh, um, feel free to, to, to reach this. Uh, at, at Amazon. Uh, and more than this, I'm a very available person. So if you want to like chat and talk more, just send me a message on, on Instagram or LinkedIn. I'm, I'm, I'm very glad to, to answer and, 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 and establish a relationship. Thank you so much, Diego. And that's been the first episode of the Business for Being.